Hi everyone, my name is Faza Meiri and I'll be talking about a project I'm working on named Tempest Radio Station. First, allow me to introduce myself. I've been developing hardware and software for more than 30 years and I'm working as a system engineer for more than a decade. I started my professional career very early. During my teen years, I cracked games and developed software tools. One of the software tools that I've developed was called the Message Sticker. And during DEF CON 25, Inbaraz showed code that he had coded to deactivate the Message Sticker. He called his software Unpuzz and I'm that Puzz. Okay, so what is Tempest? Tempest is a US NSA specification and a NATO certification. The acronym refers to information leakage uh, from a system through unintentional radio signals or audio signals or electrical signals and so on. In 1985, the researcher Wim van Eck published the first unclassified analysis of the problem. He analyzed information leakage from computer monitors. But government researchers were already aware of the problem. The US Army became aware that the equipment the Army is using uh, during World War II was emitting unintentional electromagnetic waves. And that these electromagnetic waves, the unintentional electromagnetic waves, are carrying uh, valuable data, um, classified data, out of the device. And since the 50s, the NSA is developing specification and certification for classified devices in order to reduce these unintentional, unintentional emissions uh, by grounding the equipment, shielding the equipment, separating uh, different types of data lines, and so on. Okay, how did they end up doing a project named Tempest Radio Station? Well, I read Tempest at Home, Finding Radio Frequency Side Channels by Davidov and Oldenburg. They wrote about their experiments um, transmitting electromagnetic waves from a computer to a remote receiver 50 feet away. And they manipulated the GPU clock to control the transmission. And one of the most important things that I found in their work was the until then, I, I thought, or I guessed, that the uh, electromagnetic waves emission regulation um, tests are preventing computers and cards from emitting so much energy into the air, and I was wrong. Uh, another thing I learned from their work was the use of software-defined radio receivers, or SDR receivers. These are... Um, cheap radio receivers, the most common radio receivers of this type are tunable from almost zero to two gigahertz and they have really good uh, reception quality so I bought one and I studied the electromagnetic emissions generated by my laptop and I got very interested by this work and I started wondering what can I do with it? How far can I transmit data using these emissions? And is it possible to transmit audio in real time? And above all, how hard can it be? So, to figure it out, I've decided to start the Tempest Radio Station project, transmitting audio in real time uh, using these emissions, and who knows, how hard can it be? So first, I have a project, then I need to define the project goals. Um, the first goal was tunable frequency. And this is very important because if there are a lot of computers in a single area and I want to extract data from one computer, I need to separate the data it is transmitting from the other. And perhaps I want to receive more than one computer in the same area, so I need to have a dedicated frequency per uh, computer, uh, very similar to radio stations. Uh, each radio station is uh, has its own frequency. 
And the second uh, reason for tunable frequency is that if you can choose the frequency, then you can find a quiet, relatively quiet um, uh, frequency band with as little interference as possible and transmit the data uh, in that frequency band and get a good signal to noise ratio, which is important for reception. Another goal for the, prog for the project was maximum bitrate to maximize the audio quality. Uh, the third goal was innocent looking software to avoid detection for obvious reasons. And last but not least, uh, trying to achieve maximum distance. Okay, so um, let's begin with a crash course uh, of ra about radio waves. Um, transmission. When you take a conductor and you uh, pass time-varying electric current through it, it will emit electromagnetic uh, radiation that will propagate from it to space. And reception works the other way around. If an electromagnetic radiation is close to a conductor, it will um, generate time-varying electric current in it. And this is transmission and reception of electromagnetic waves in a nutshell. Uh, this could be done with any conductor. It could either be wires or um, for this project, uh, PCB traces. PCB is the printed circuit boards that carry the electric uh, components inside the computers. Uh, traces are the uh, fine wires within the PCB that connect between the terminals of the electrical components. And that's Radio Waves Crash Course. Another important thing to understand about broadcasting is modulation. Modulation is the manipulation that we do on the uh, carrier wave, the, the um, elect expanding electromagnetic waves, in order to make it carry the data that we want it to carry. Um, most of you probably heard about amplitude modulation and frequency modulation, which are the two common uh, methods used by um, commercial radio. Uh, but there are other types of modulation. The most simple type of modulation is the on-off keying. Um, you have an energy source, you turn it on, it emits energy, you turn it off, it stops emitting energy, and you can um, put the data or encode the data in the duration of the pulse. And uh, if the transmitter and receiver has the same protocol, then they can pass the data from one to another. The most um, common and known uh, on-off keying modulation use is Morse code. Morse code has only two symbols, a short pulse and a long pulse. And you use those two symbols to transmit the whole alphabet, words, sentences, and so on. Okay, so we understand that we can turn PCB traces in the computers into uh, electromagnetic waves generators. And we know that if we can take a line and make it generate, uh, make it emit energy at our will and control the duration and stop uh, the line from emitting energy at our will, then we have on-off keying uh, modulation. Now we need to have such a signal. Okay, so um, the signals I uh, decided to use were the um, signals between the GPU and the GDDR. The GDDR is the memory installed in the graphic cards. And the GPU perform memory read and write operations by operating the control and data lines of the GDDR. Here you can see in this slide a timing diagram of GDDR6, which is a common uh, memory type these days. And there are four uh, major lines that the GPU is operating. The two uh, um, signals uh, in the upper side of the graph are CK and CA. CA is the commanding signal. Uh, 
and the GPU uses the commanding signal to command the memory to do a write operation or a read operation. And CK is the clock of CA. It helps the GPU to command the uh, memory. Similar to that, there are the two uh, lower signals. Uh, the data signal is, carries the data itself, and WCK is the clock of the data. Whenever the GPU is performing a write operation or a read operation, it operates these lines. When it is not performing a read or a write operation, it is not operating these lines. And this is the key to the on-off keying, meaning that when we want to transmit a symbol, we start a memory read or write, and the duration of the operation is predefined by us, and when it ends, the energy is stopped being transmitted. Okay, let's talk about the duration of the pulse. The electromagnetic radiation, as I explained, is emitted when the control and data lines are active. It is not emitted when it is not active. So we need now to control the duration. There is an um, almost linear connection between the time it takes to write a batch of bytes and the size of the batch of the bytes. So if we have a small volume of bytes to write, it will be a short operation. If we have a big uh, volume of bytes to write, then it will be a very long writing operation. And that's the key to control the symbol length. Um, whenever we are performing a memory transfer, a symbol will be transmitted, and the duration is uh, predefined by the amount of bytes that are going to be uh, read and written um, during the memory transfer. As I explained, the connection between symbol duration and symbol byte count is almost linear. This is because the GPU hardware is using, using dedicated hardware to perform a large memory transfers. And this dedicated hardware is time deterministic. So um, to define the on-off keying protocol between the transmitter and the receiver, I need to predefine to both what is a symbol, and I define the symbols in the following manner. The symbol duration equals to symbol value plus one, multiplied by, the, by a time constant that both the transmitter and the receiver know in advance. The plus one helps me to avoid a, a zero duration if I have a zero symbol value. Um, in order to uh, transmit uh, these symbols, I need to uh, transfer a known amount of bytes. So the symbol transfer size, which is relative to the symbol duration, equals symbol value plus one, multiplied by a bytes constant. And, and as I explained, there is a linear relationship between the time constant and the byte constant. So if I do a very large memory transfer, measure the time it takes to perform the transfer, then I get the ratio between bytes constant and time constant. And that's the whole story. Here you can see it graphically. Um, in the upper graph, you see the energy being emitted for three different symbols. In the lower graph, you can see um, the relation between the um, calculation I showed you in the for in the last uh, slide and the uh, uh, amount of time it takes to transmit each symbol. Here you can see, for example, the symbol value five. You add one to it, you get six. Six multiplied by time constant, and this is the size of the symbol. Again, you can see it for symbol value three and symbol value eight. Why using the GDDR memory? Um, when I chose the GDDR memory, I had good reasons uh, following the project goals. The first and most important was that it has tunable frequency. You can set the memory, uh, the GDDR memory frequency uh, by APIs that are available. 
Um, it's very easy to do so, and I did it. The second thing was because it, the hardware is very time deterministic, and it helped me build solid, good symbols, um, which are transmitted and then received. And the, because it is very time deterministic, I can get the same results over and over and over on different computers and different hardware. And most, most of the time, the GPU is idle because when it's not in use, it's idle. And when it is idle, it's not doing anything. And it's a free resource. Then why not use it? So I used it. This is Scotty. Scotty is the transmission software. Uh, it is installed on the computer that is broadcasting the uh, data, the audio. On the top left, you see a GPU list. And here you select the GPU that you want to use, the graphical card that you want to use. The graphics card, sorry. And below that, you have two checkboxes to start the transmission. The, the first one is for internal testing, and the other one is to transmit a WAV file. The name of the WAV file is written in the line down below. Uh, to the right of GPU's list, you see memory clock. This is WCK, the data memory clock. Uh, to its right, you can see a divider value and the data value. The data value is the data, the value of the data that is being written in the memory. And you can see memory base clock. This is CA, the command clock. The relationship between the memory clock and the base clock is in this case four. And the values here are um, relative to each graphic card. The graphic card is uh, can, can um, tell you the type of memory that it is uh, installed inside the graphic card. And from the parameters uh, it gives you, you can get to these numbers. Um, below memory clock, you see base clock shift. This is the way that I'm uh, moving the base clock um, and tuning the base clock. Uh, to its right, you can see a shift frequency checkbox that uh, command Scotty to perform the uh, frequency shift. And to, to its right, you can see the center frequency. This is the frequency that Scotty is calculating by adding the memory base clock uh, to a base clock shift. And this is the result. More important is uh, the indicator below it, which is called measured transmission frequency, because this is the trans transmission frequency that the GPU is measuring. And this is the actual frequency that is carrying the data. Below base clock shift, you see two bitrate indicators. The lower one, data bitrate, is showing you the uh, data bitrate, but only the data. This is the um, pure data bitrate. And the raw bitrate uh, equals to the data bitrate plus uh, additional uh, bits that are used for um, uh, control and uh, monitoring um, to build a data packet. The last indicator is data transmitted uh, in percentage, which is the uh, percentage of the data that was transmitted from the WAV file. OK, so what does Scotty do? Scotty is doing the following tasks. It is measuring the time required to perform large GPU memory transfers. It is calculating the bytes constant uh, for a predefined time constant, which is uh, predefined for both transmitter and receiver. It is setting the GDDR memory clock frequency or broadcasting frequency. And it is loading a WAV file and transmitting 8,000 audio PCM samples every second. I targeted uh, the CK uh, clock, the command clock, as my main broadcasting frequency. And this is why I'm referring to setting GDDR memory clock frequency as setting the transmission frequency. 
Okay, so we have the wave file and it is broken by Scotty every second to 8,000 audio PCM samples and then it is transmitting the 8,000 uh, audio PCM samples um, in one second intervals. And first it is encoding the 8,000 audio PCM samples, then it is bundling the data into packets according to protocol, to a protocol, sorry. Um, and the protocol comprises header bytes, um, read Solomon forward error correction parity bytes to, uh, for error correction uh, uh, recovery at the receiver. Um, audio packets counter to count how many packets were already sent. And G726 encoded audio bytes, this is the real payload. And audio data checksum bytes to see that the data is valid at the receiver. Um, Scotty is transmitting each packet um, symbol by symbol and when all 8,000 samples have been transmitted the software stops and waits for the one second interval to elapse. Okay, so Scotty is now transmitting the data uh, to free space um, and the electromagnetic waves are propagating um, in the area and this is the reason why we'll talk now about the um, radio path or the wave path. Um, Scott is transmitting the data from the computer which is seen on the left. Um, to the right side of the graph you can see of the chart you can see uh, the reception equipment which comprises an antenna that converts the electromagnetic waves to time-varying current. Uh, after that, you can see a low noise amplifier that amplifies these weak signals. And then an SDR receiver that receives the signals, samples the, the signals, and passes the samples to a computer, a reception computer, that runs a software named Spock, that is extracting the data from the signals. In the middle, you can see a photograph of this uh, reception equipment. Here you can see how uh, CK, uh, the wave, uh, the, the electromagnetic waves that are emitted from the CK uh, PCB traces, is received 50 feet away from the source computer. You see here um, power versus uh, frequency uh, band. And you should expect for a fixed frequency, fixed clock frequency, uh, to see all the energy concentrated on a single frequency, the clock frequency. As you can understand, this is not the case. Um, the manufacturers are shifting the clock um, in small portions, up and down, up and down. Um, and in this uh, graph, it would be uh, right and left, right and left. And they are doing so to reduce the average power per frequency. And why is that? Um, both cards manufacturers and computer manufacturers has to pass um, electromagnetic waves uh, emission tests. Um, these emission tests are required to uh, get uh, regulation approval. And if all of the energy would have been concentrated on a single frequency, they might not um, pass the test. The power might be too uh, large and pass the uh, threshold of the test and the card or the computer will fail the test. To um, better prepare for these tests, the manufacturer are spreading the energy on a small frequency band and uh, this way they are lowering the average power per frequency and by this method they are uh, improving the chances of passing the uh, regulation tests. 
And this is why the signal looks the way it is. Okay, so we spoke about Scotty, and now let's speak about Spock. Uh, here you can see the screen uh, of Spock. Uh, on the left top side, you can see the SDRs list. These are these SDR uh, receivers available on the computer. And below that, you can see center frequency, which is the frequency that you need to set to uh, receive the data. Below that, you can see two gain uh, controls. They are used to set the system gain, the SDR system gain. And to get the best result, you need to t tune all three of them, the center frequency, the gain reduction, and the LNA state. Once you set the frequency and the system gain, uh, and you get good reception, all you need to do is to check the play audio checkbox below the system gain, and hear the audio. In the middle portion of the screen, you see the sample versus time graph. And here you can see the waveforms. The, the samples are uh, creating waveforms. And here you can see two symbols, and the shape of the waveforms is uh, highly uh, influenced by the spreading technique I explained earlier, the spread spectrum clock generation, uh, that shifts the clock uh, up and down, or in the graph right and left. And this is how it looks like uh, uh, over time. And um, below that, you can see three checkboxes are used for debugging. The most important of them is the clear numbers on the right, because it is clearing the statistics on the right. And on the right side of the screen, you can see um, all sort of information which helped me develop the software and analyze the quality of the reception. Uh, you can see how many samples are per iteration, how many good packets were received, lost packets that are lost, uh, the good packets ratio, which is important because it is indicating the quality of the reception, and other types of data. Okay, what is Spock doing? Um, well, it is doing a lot. Um, Spock is doing two batches of tasks. The first batch of tasks is um, dealing with the samples, the raw samples that are being picked up uh, from the air and analyzing and processing these signals and getting the symbols out of these samples. And the second batch of tasks is um, working with the symbols to recover the data. So let's speak about the first batch of tasks. Um, Spock is setting up the SDR receiver. It is receiving cyclic batches of samples from the SDR receiver. It is calculating the absolute amplitude of the samples. Don't be intimidated. There's a graph in the next slide explaining it better. Uh, it is filtering the data with a low pass filter. It is calculating the amplitude threshold to recover the symbols. And it is recovering the symbols using all of this data. And it saves the length of each symbol, the duration of each symbol in a buffer. Here you can see it in a graph, and I hope it will be much clearer. Uh, at the top graph, we see the uh, absolute value of the samples. And you can see the symbols here, uh, power versus time. And in the middle graph, you see the filtered values. And it looks much more like digital data. And in the lower graph, you see the digitized data, the recovered symbols. As I spoke earlier, Spock is doing two batches of tasks. This is the second batch. Now that it has the uh, duration of each symbol, it has the symbol value. So uh, it is looking for the header bytes, the header symbols. Um, if you recall, each packet starts with header bytes, and when you have the symbols, it starts with header symbols. Uh, once it found the header symbols, it can recover the packet. So it is recovering the data packet from the symbols. And then it is using forward error correction decoding to correct errors uh, in the data, uh, if any. And afterward, it is verifying packet validity. If the packet is valid, 
then it is decoding the audio using a G726 decoder and it is storing the PCM samples in a buffer. If there are any missing packets, lost packets, it is filling the uh, PCM samples uh, buffer with zeros and then it is playing the audio. And that's the whole circle between Scotty and Spock. Let's talk about tests. Um, the first uh, batch of tests that they did uh, had the following properties. Uh, time constant was set to 14 microseconds. The data packet structure was four header bytes, 20 read Solomon forward error correction parity bytes, uh, a single audio packets counter, and 63 uh, encoded audio bytes and I used two bits per PCM uh, encoding, per PCM sample encoding. Um, and last but not least, uh, two audio data checksum bytes. Um, each packet was transmitted with four bits per symbol. Uh, I took every byte, divided it into two uh, nibbles and transmitted uh, four bits per symbol. Here you can see the computers I used uh, for the tests. One was a laptop computer and one was, one was a desktop computer. You can see here the uh, hardware of the two computers. Here you can see the setup in my apartment. Uh, on the left you can see the laptop computer on the table. On the right, you can see the reception equipment, and in the middle, you can see the corridor inside the apartment. And at one end, you see the laptop computer, on, on the other end, you see the antenna. Here, you can see the same setup, but for the desktop computer. On the left, you can see the desktop computer on the table, on the right, the reception equipment, and in the middle, the corridor with both sides. Okay, let's see some tests. Here you can see Scotty on a laptop. It's in flight mode. And here it begins to transmit. And now that you got good sense of the raw bitrate, I'm walking backwards to the reception equipment. This is the reception equipment. The antenna. Low noise amplifier. And SDR receiver. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive, flight mode, of course. Today, despite the fact that this and this is Spock. scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years in a rate of growth. More than three times that Let's clear the numbers. Of our population as a whole. Despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. And that was the laptop. This is the desktop. You can see row bitrate.
despite the fact and that this nation's own scientific manpower is doubling every 12 years in a rate of growth more than three times that of our population as a whole. Despite that, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. And that's the first batch. Here are the test results. I got uh, good audio and good uh, average bitrate, but and I even got a good uh, packets ratio. But I noticed some pr something interesting. I got on the desktop better uh, ratio when the monitor was turned off than when it was turned on. And so I've started to in investigate this. Um, when I examined the signals, I understood that the desktop computer is emitting signals which Scotty did not generate. And the computer stops transmitting these signals once the monitor is turned off by the Windows power plan. So, uh, since I got better results with the monitor off, uh, I've decided to um, set the um, parameters, the packet uh, structure differently for a second uh, batch of tests and try to, ach to achieve better audio quality. So I set the time constant to 8 microseconds. I used 4 Reed Solomon forward error correction parity bytes instead of 20 in the first batch. And I uh, used 3 bits per PCM sample encoding instead of 2. Let's see what I got. This is the desktop, of course, and you can see a higher bitrate. And this is Spock. In an hour. And as you can see, there are a lot of lost packets. The audio quality is quite poor. The reception quality is quite poor. And this is because the monitor is still on. So let's wait a few seconds to see how it will go when the display will be off. And this is with the display off. You can see that the lost packets indicator has halted, and the good packets ratio is increasing, and we get good audio. to use the skins of animals to cover them. Then about 10 years ago, under this standard, man emerged from his caves to construct other kinds of shelter. Clearing the numbers. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there, well space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. It's a wonderful speech by JFK, and I recommend you all to listen to it. It's a great speech. 
So these are the test results. I got better audio and better uh, bit rate and better packet rate and everything is great. Um, the whole project was um, designed around CK, the command uh, clock, but it is important to remember that other signals are being uh, transmitted as well on the same time. We have the four basic signals here, but there are more derived signals from these signals, and there are a lot of signals being transmitted at every um, symbol transmission. So if you can't get your data on one frequency, you might find it on different frequencies. Let's see an example of that. Here you can see um, the uh, power versus frequency of a uh, signal, which equals uh, the command clock uh, divided by two. And you can see good power. And here you can see that Spock receives it well, you get uh, 99.6 uh, good, pack, uh, good packets ratio. The only difference you may see is in the waveforms. The waveform of half of CK is different from the waveform of CK. And um, to, if you want to receive this signal instead of CK, then you need to adjust um, Spock to uh, process the samples uh, with this waveform to get the best result, but as you can see, this was not uh, handled or tampered in any way, and it just gives good reception. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about conclusions. The first are the fun conclusions. First, it works, yay! The second conclusion is that my apartment is too small for the range tests. Um, I had enough power, I could have gone further, but that's the length of the corridor, so that was it for me. And I got so excited that I've made the jingle for Tempest Radio Station. Let's hear it. Tempest Radio. That is the jingle. But let's talk about more alarming conclusions. First, time memory transfers are easy to produce. Um, it's only memory transfers and you can leak data just like you can leak audio because as you saw the audio was already digitized they could have passed any other payload that I could choose um, you can use this method on air gap computer uh, you look at an air gap computer it doesn't have any radio based communication channel but if it has a GPU, then you can use this method to get the information out of it. And this is most important during non-working hours because the GPU is idle, there's no supervision, um, the monitor can be turned off to uh, achieve maximum bitrate, either by the attacker or by the company's the IT policy. And uh, the attacker can choose the time of transmissions, for example, it can hide the reception equipment in the parking lot and choose the data to be transmitted from um, 9 p.m. till midnight and get the data. Everything I spoke about is not supervised by any software, not by antivirus, firewalls, port monitoring, software, whatever. And this is important not only to, for example, extract plans and design from internal networks. You can also do it on open networks, uh, networks that are connected to the internet because nobody is monitoring this channel. It's an open channel. And since nobody is monitoring, you can pass whatever you want. And as long as you can hide the reception equipment and get the data out, you can enjoy. Tempest Radio. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, here are the links to the source code uh, on GitHub for both Scotty and Spock. And here you can see the references from my work. Uh, thanks again, and I hope you enjoyed it.